joining us at the Central Asia program at the Institute for European Russian Eurasian Studies here at GW. Thank you for choosing us against the weather also, <laughs> so we do appreciate. We are very lucky today to receive Professor Theodor Gerber, who is the Professor of Sociology and Director of the Center for Russia, East Europe and Central Asia at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Ted will conduct research on social stratification, public opinion, social demography and other topics in Russia and the other former Soviet countries, especially Azerbaijan, Ukraine, and Kyrgyzstan. But today we ask uh, Ted to present his current research on Russia's Muslim public opinion, because that's the kind of topic that is usually not very well studied. So Kadyrov is used to make the news in the DC policy community when we speak about Islam in Russia, but we thought it was really important also to have a kind of, to go away from the media bubble and to look at more what we can know about the, the Muslim uh, public opinion in Russia. So Ted, the floor is yours. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. I will stand up. This, uh, so now I'm more, feels more normal. Uh, that's okay with you guys. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, also, let me reiterate uh, the appreciation for, for going the beautiful weather outside and coming to uh, the talk today. Um, so um, I have a, the subtitle of my talk is Caliphate Kadyrovism or Kasha. And, um, you know, I struggled a little bit to find the perfect alliterative combination of three words, but that, those are sort of shorthand for three different ways you might look at uh, the public opinion of Russia's Muslims, and I'll explain a little bit more what those three different scenarios are. Uh, so this is work, co-authored work with Jane Zaviska as part of a larger project that Jane and I, Jane's also a sociologist, uh, she's at the University of Arizona, but, but I'll say more about the larger project as well. So, um... Russia's Muslim population, I mean, you probably, most of the people in this room are familiar with this, but I thought it's useful to just sort of review a few uh, sort of facts uh, to emphasize a point that it is a very substantial population, it's a very substantial component of uh, Russia, and it's a very large Muslim population in international terms. So it is only 1% of the world's Muslim population, which seems like a small uh, number, but uh, it's substantially larger if we incorporate the other former Soviet republics, then that figure goes up to about 5% of the world's Muslims live in the former Soviet territory. It's actually uh, the fourth largest minority Muslim population in the world after India, Ethiopia, and China. So um, in terms of countries that have you know, Muslim minorities, it's right up there in the top five. Uh, it's also the largest Muslim population in Europe. <laughs> so if you consider Russia to be part of Europe, which you know, a lot of people do, um, it actually has more Muslims than any other single European country, as a graphic I'll show in a minute demonstrates. So uh, the, uh, the estimated uh, figures are the following. So in 2010, it was estimated that there were 16.4 uh, Muslims in the country. And the way they come up with this is by aggregating the, the populations of, of ethnic groups, which are majority Muslim, and treating them as if they're all Muslim. They don't actually from what I understand, on the Russian census is asked question of religious uh, affiliation. So they don't actually know, there is no real count of Muslims, but the best estimate is that there are 16.4 million in 2010, and it's projected given fertility and migration patterns, so, so there's some uncertainty in this projection, as with all demographic projections, uh, but nonetheless it's projected that 18 point, there will be 18.6 Muslims by the year 2030, uh, so the Muslim population is projected to increase, where the Russian population, by most estimates, is likely to continue to decrease, uh, despite some recent improvements in fertility. Um, also, a distinctive feature that, in contrast to most European countries, where the large proportions of Muslim populations tend to be immigrants, uh, most Russian Muslims are actually born within the Russian Federation. So it's a homegrown uh, uh, Russian uh, Muslim population, although of course we know that there are many immigrants from Central Asia and other countries who are Muslims residing in Russia at any given time as well. So there's a few graphics. These are from a uh, Pew Research uh, uh, website which um, has details on uh, Muslim populations. So this, this map shows, so, sort of, it uh, resizes all the countries <laughs> in the world in terms of their Muslim populations. That's kind of a neat. But you see, so Russia is not you know, huge, but if you include the other Soviet republics, it comes out 
to be a bit more. And here is the size of Russia's Muslim population relative to other European countries. So Germany, France, you know, they both have fairly large, but Russia. Uh, now, of course, you know, a lot of Muslims live in the Asian part of Russia, uh, but be that as it may, uh, it's still, you know, the, the point is that Russia has a big Muslim population. Okay? <laughs> uh, he actually, uh, the oil region distribution is also worth pointing out that they, they, there is concentration. So this is the percentage of Russia's Muslims who live in different republics. So actually, Dagestan is the largest single of the oblasts or republics, whatever you want to call them, the provincial territorial units um, uh, in terms of you know, where Russia, Russia's Muslims tend to live, followed by Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, those two Volga regions. Uh, with Tatar and some Bashkir uh, populations, other North Caucasus republics, Chechnya, Kavni, and Balkari, Bushetia, um, and then uh, oh, three percent of Russia's Muslims live in Moscow, and then others, just all the other territories aside from these. So they're fairly dispersed, although they are concentrated, of course, in the North Caucasus and the two uh, Volga territories. Um, all right, so the so they're. The map for those of you who uh, don't have the map of Russia memorized. Uh, this is the North Caucasus. Uh, Dagestan is this big, you know, L-shaped uh, republic there. Uh, Tatarstan, Bashkortostan. Um, okay, lots of fun graphics. North Caucasus in more detail, right? Because I can never remember, you know, which was. so. Dagestan, you know, Chechnya, is tucked in inside Dagestan. Uh, Kavanina, Balkaria, Karachay, Cherkessia, North Ossetia, not too many Muslims in, in there. Uh, English Ossetia, of course, and then Krasnodar, Stavropol, uh, more Russified. You know, there are, of course, some Muslims in there. Uh, but uh, the big ones are, of course, Dagestan, and then, you know, that sort of string of territories connected to. Okay, we actually, I think Marlon is correct. I mean, my own sense is we really don't know too much about uh, Russia's Muslim population. Uh, of course, you know, as, as Marlon mentioned, Kadyrov makes a lot of news. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the, the, we know that there's wars in Chechnya. That, you know, there's, uh, there are some who argue, uh, there have been you know, two wars, some have argued that... Um, there, that Russia's Muslim population has posed a threat, that there's been efforts to radicalize it. Others have tended to downplay that uh, tendency, suggesting that you know, for a long period of time, Russia's Muslim population has been very moderate, very well integrated. Um, one of the thing, one of the many goals we had in our study is to actually generate a large enough sample of Muslims in the survey part uh, that we did in Russia in order to try to, to get some empirical information about uh, Russia's Muslims. So one of the problems, although there are 16 million of them, if you just do a random sample survey, you know, it's hard to generate enough Muslim respondents to really make any kinds of uh, clear claims with any sort of statistical reliability about uh, the opinions of Muslims, their relative standard of living, their economic well-being, their levels of regime support. And so, in a nutshell, that's what we sort of set out to do, and uh, today I'm going to present to you our first attempt to, to sort of start to, to look at some of these data, to make uh, some conclusions. So, in thinking about this, it seems like, you know, we, we in order to talk about uh, Muslims, we need to think in terms of um, uh, the, the history of the North Caucasus, the recent history of the North Caucasus, and the tremendous uh, conflicts uh, that have been going on there, and then plus the rise of Kadyrov, so I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Um, I don't really know as much about my, myself about uh, the Volga regions, um, so, but I will say a little bit about, uh, you know, there have been some events in the last you know, five years or so suggesting that there are growing tensions surrounding religious issues, issues of extremism in Tatarstan in particular. I know even less about Bashkortostan than Tatarstan, so maybe some of you, I'm hoping that some of you in the audience can actually educate me some, I'm sure Marlene uh, can do so. Uh, but then, you know, so, so the, ultimately the question I'm going to address, that we want to address empirically is, you know, how well integrated are Russia's Muslims uh, into the political mainstream? Are they, you know, do they have a distinctive sort of sets of political views? Are they a source of support for the Putin regime? Or are they, uh, you know, a potential source of instability that, uh, 
uh, Russia's uh, rulers or, or, or uh, leaders um, uh, will have to contend with in the growing years when I think it's fair to expect we'll see uh, increasing pressure on the Russian leadership to deal with various sources of, in of instability. So, uh, the North Caucasus, um, now, Chechnya had two periods of independence uh, with the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. There was a period where, you know, de facto, Moscow had very little control uh, over what was going on in Chechnya. General Dudayev was in charge. Uh, then, of course, and then there was a succession of uh, internecine battles within uh, the Chechen uh, uh, elites. And um, eventually, uh, Yeltsin decided to uh, try to send in, to try to reassert the authority of Moscow with a brutal military campaign starting in 1994 uh, that succeeded mainly in causing a lot of uh, death and destruction. It reached until it sort of reached a, a, a stalemate, which was effectively a Russian retreat uh, brokered by General Levin. Um, so from 19, again from 1996 to 1999, Chechnya had de facto independence, although you know in some sense it was you no, know, it wasn't recognized as an independent country by by anybody. Uh, but then, uh, after a series of militant uh, attacks from uh, Chechen uh, radicals uh, in neighboring republics in Dagestan, in particular, uh, there was a, a new campaign spearheaded uh, uh, by Putin. One of his first acts. Some people. People sometimes tend to forget this, but one of the first things he did when he was appointed initially prime minister by Yeltsin prior, prior to being elected president was he led this big uh, renewed military assault on Chechnya, which seemed to be much more successful, at least uh, in terms of how it was covered, how it was sold, how it was represented to the Russian public. He took care of the problem, and that was a major source of his popularity in the early days. And the Russians thought that he had brought this problem to an end. Nonetheless, Throughout much of the 2000s, there was a low-level uh, guerrilla warfare going on between Russian troops and uh, some uh, some remaining insurgents or rebels or extremists, whatever you want to call them, um, until the mid-2000s when Ramzan Kadyrov, the son of a former of a, a, another president, uh, came to power and uh, was able to uh, through a combination of uh, of support from the, the Kremlin and also through his own uh, success at organizing uh, military militants under his command, he was able to effectively establish uh, some kind of order in the Chechen Republic and defeat the insurgents and really um, hound them. And, and so the conflict was effectively Chechenized, where the Russian regime decided to rely on Kadyrov. Um, at that time, uh, although peace, uh, or sort of peace, order, let's say, not peace, order came to Chechnya, uh, but at that point, then the violence, uh, which, you know, to some extent had a religious element to it, there is, there are religious extremists in the Caucasus, um, it's a matter of some dispute and disagreement, the, to, uh, the extent to which the violence that has been experienced there is really driven by religious extremism as opposed to you know, criminal groups or other self-interested parties trying to assert some kind of uh, uh, interest or claim on resources. Uh, but there, you know, there's no doubt that there is some element of Islamic extremism and that you know, various jihadist group, international jihadist groups have sent some people into the region to try to you know, provoke conflict and promote uh, their extremist ideas. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it, what we do know is that the violence has spread from Chechnya, mostly to neighboring republics, but also throughout Russia. So uh, by, this, these, these numbers come from a report by the International Crisis uh, Group, which has a very detailed analysis of the situation uh, that just came out this March. Uh, so there have been 75 major terror attacks against soft targets in Russian cities, so throughout all of Russia. A lot of those in the North Caucasus area, but of course some famous ones in, in Moscow as well, Volgograd, you know, other, other uh, cities. Uh, there have been hundreds of attacks against security service uh, installations or members and also against official religious and political leaders. Uh, in 2007, you know, a Chechen, uh, the, I think Doku Amarov was the, he was a member of the Chechen uh, regime in the second period of independence, wasn't he, under uh, 
and he uh, declared that there uh, uh, a Caucasus Emirate that you know, was to be a uni unified sort of Islamic movement uh, or, or state that was uh, going to defeat the Russian government and cast out the occupiers. And that got a lot of attention at the time. It seemed like a major threat. So it was an extending, extending it, was, it was a really sort of clear statement of a religious goal to this insurgency to the battle between the extremists and the Russian authorities. Um, by 2009, Chechnya was really pretty much under, solidly under Kadyrov's control. There had been very, very little uh, sort of overt uh, attacks against the authorities, so to speak, in Chechnya. And at that point, the violence really spread to Dagestan in particular, a little bit in English Chetia as well. Uh, but there was a really, so, so many did describe the period of 2010 through 2012 in Dagestan as one of a virtual guerrilla war zone where there was, uh, uh, and, and the federal troops, uh, Russian federal troops accordingly uh, were deployed to, using very brutal, harsh counterinsurgency tactics. Uh, there also were some well-known um, incidents in company in Bulgaria. Um, the, and, you know, so, some have argued that the repressive counterinsurgency operations helped fuel the cycle of continuing violence as uh, victims of uh, attacks by uh, Zachisky or whatever by federal forces then took up arms and continued to try to attack the troops. At any rate, uh, less notice is the fact that actually in the last two years, the levels of violence are substantially down in the North Caucasus. So uh, by the, the, the groups that have managed, so CSIS is uh, down, down the road, I guess, across town. Uh, they, you know, for a while, were keeping a website uh, tracking violent incidents, and others have also done the same. But the violence seems to be down. It, it was a 46 drop percent drop in civilian victims of uh, political violence in the region in 2014 relative to 2013, and then another 51 percent drop in 2015. So what caused this drop in violence? Well, according to this International Crisis Group report, uh, several things. Though. So first of all, in the run-up to the Sochi Olympics, the Russian uh, troop, the Russian really mobilized its security forces and really did its best to hound and crush and eliminate uh, the the uh, extremists or insurgents, uh, going so far as to use poisoning campaigns where they poisoned uh, some uh, important leaders. Um, it, because they were really concerned, you know, Umar threatened that the Olympics were going to be disruptive and the Federal Security Service were quite dedicated to prevent that from happening, quite committed to preventing that from happening. And so they, they really ramped up the campaign. Um, and so, you know, they, I guess, were effective. Uh, another explanation is that with the growing battle uh, in Syria, or the, the, the rise of the Islamic State movement, uh, initially in Iraq and then spreading to Syria and other uh, re other countries in the region, that that became an attractive, uh, a more attractive uh, outlet for uh, Islamic radicals in the North Caucasus uh, to devote their efforts to, because things weren't going so well in the North Caucasus, whereas um, ISIS or ISIL or whatever you want to call it, Daesh. Uh, they had a very compelling narrative. They seemed to have a lot of successes early on. They were posing a real threat uh, the, to um, um, the, the authorities. Uh, they were taking on Assad in Syria. And so, you know, it seems that in, in the, in the Russian security services also took some actions to make it easier for those guys to go and fight in, with, uh, with the Islamic State. And so those two forces combined seem to have led to a period of relative... Uh, peace. Um, at the same time, you know, in the region, the deep structural problems having to do with uh, uh, local government corruption, with uh, uh, lack of transparency in local governance, with a really sort of a, a clan-based or, or group or special interest, ruled by special interests in a very sort of a complex fashion. And the economic poverty of the region is not a, it's one of the poor regions in Russia. There's not a strong economic base. There's tremendous inequality. Uh, those are lingering concerns. So this ICC, or the ICG report, concludes that one of the policy recommendations that Russia should invest more uh, in a longer term de-radicalization strategy to take advantage of this period of relatively low level violence 
by addressing the legitimate concerns uh, or the grievances in the North Caucasus better and coping with the root causes as opposed to just assuming that the problem has been taken care of. Okay, so while this is happening, Kadyrov, Ramzan Kadyrov, has risen to national problems within Russia. So uh, I think, what, what is Kadyrov? Is, what does Kadyrov represent? I mean, he's, he says a lot of things. He's had a lot of antics. He gets some of his more outlandish actions and statements and behavior get a lot of press. But I think there is a pattern. Uh, there are some sort of repeated themes that, that have emerged that I think characterize you know, a, a concerted political strategy on the part of Kadyrov. And uh, that is that, that what he provides to the Kremlin is a, an effective pacification of the Islamic radicals and a preservation of order in Chechnya in exchange for financial support and also a relative degree of autonomy from the Kremlin. So the Kremlin, so basically, you know, the, the deal is so long as Kadyrov keeps the Chechen problem, so to speak, under wraps, keeps under control, he gets to have his little fiefdom where the Kremlin doesn't challenge his authority. And in fact, is grateful for the last couple of weeks we've seen a sort of gamesmanship going on between Putin and Kadyrov, where Kadyrov is like, okay, I think I'm done with this. You know, I, I, you, don't, you don't like uh, what I'm doing, then try someone else for trade. And Putin, oh, no, you know, we'll reappoint you. But then, you know, shaking his finger and saying, you have to behave yourself in the direct line. Uh, um, and I go, I, I, I know if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, that's fine. It's not that we can talk about it more. I don't want to go into the details. So, so anyway, so, so the deal is that um, they had this deal. But I think uh, Kadyrov has aspired, you know, is quite clear to more than that. He's not happy with just having his little fiefdom in Chechnya. He would like to play a more prominent national role. Part of what he's done that's been quite consistent, I think, is, is promote policies of social conservatism that are consistent with some of the stuff the Russian government has been doing in the last, uh, you know, particularly since the mid 2000s, promoting a socially conservative agenda. So, uh, but Kadyrov has a particular Islamic sort of influence version of that. He's uh, implemented elements of Sharia law, not consistently and not fully, but by and large, it's been something that he's done. Uh, he's, you know, tacitly or openly supported things such as polygamy, uh, traditional dress strictures for women, so, you know, restrictions on, you know, on women's, uh, the insistence that they wear headscarves, for example, um, and then banning alcohol, things like that. Kadyrov has expressed hyper-loyalty to Putin, so again and again, he has these big, uh, you know, he makes these statements, has these press conferences, has these big events where he declares his undying loyalty to Putin and how he's Putin's uh, greatest advocate, uh, and part of that is his extreme condemnation of opposition, uh, oppositional figures, and the very notion of opposition. He calls them traitors, you know, fifth column, and um, enemies of the people, and he's publicly, uh, I remember seeing this video at the time of the uh, 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 protest where, you know, someone was interviewing him, it was on YouTube, and he said, oh, I'll take some. You know, I'll take a few divisions down to Moscow. I'll show them how to deal with those protesters. We'll just run them over with tanks and crush their bones into <coughs> smithereens. I mean, and he's uh, threatened to. You know, he recently released a video, famously, where you know, people such as Kasyanov, he he showed under a target, saying, you know, these people. And he's been implicated in a number of political assassinations, uh, well, including uh, Boris Nemtsov, but also the journalist Natalia. Estemirova, the human rights activist Natalia Estemirova, and uh, Anna Polakovskaya. So, you know, there's quite a weird mishmash of sort of hyper pro Putin, pro government, but also at the same time with this sort of socially conservative flavor, um, and it's all contingent on uh, his autonomy. So I didn't put that up there, but he's also uh, got a lot of press for declaring that. Uh, uh, the if FSB or any uh, Russian Federal Security uh, Service agents want to enter the territory of Chechnya, Chechnya, they may not do so unless they receive official permission in advance. And if they try to do so, they're going to have to be prepared to, you know, face the consequences. So, I mean, that's quite a declaration of the non-sovereignty of the Russian federal government over the territory of Chechnya. Okay, so. 
that's just I think some background. And, and so what, what I think one way to you know to, to think about what we're about with this study is trying to see so how popular are these kinds of uh, ideas? Or is it just Kadir of this crazy guy doing this stuff, or is there some broader support, particularly within the Muslim community in the region, for a lot of these? Uh, uh, aspects of Kadirovism, um, or is he just perceived as a, a tyrant? Um, uh, in the Volga region, so historically, so, so they're quite different ethnically, and they have a very different historical trajectory from the North Caucasus, that the Tatars are the primary ethnic group, and the, the, of course there's Bashkirs as well, in Bashkortostan. Um, by most accounts, they're, the, the, you know, in contrast to the peoples of the North Caucasus, the Tatars are felt better integrated into Russian society uh, for quite some time. Uh, there's much less of, uh, so, so they never really, uh, there's not a his, the same history of uh, resistance to Russian colonial rule that characterized the North Caucasus in uh, those mid-Volga regions, at least not in, sort of, not since uh, the gathering of the Russians or whatever. I mean, I'm not a historian, so I'm not even gonna, um, but uh, they, you know, the early years of the post-Soviet Russia Tatarstan under Shamiyev was uh, particularly effective at gaining some autonomy in striking a deal with Yeltsin. Um, some of those uh, forms of autonomy from federal control have been rolled back under Putin. Uh, in terms of the religious practices, by the, the accounts that I've read suggest that, you know, by and large, the form of uh, Islam practiced in uh, Tatarstan and Bashkortostan is much more uh, anti-Salafi, anti-radical, very moderate, very uh, an integration of, uh, there's this Hanafi tradition that's uh, uh, really, you know, not prone to sort of, uh, doesn't preach some kind of uh, political objective of taking over the state or of uh, freeing uh, the territory of infidels or anything like that. There have been some signs of growing conflicts in the region. So there was an assassination, uh, actually two assassinations. One of them, they failed to, to kill the target, but they severely wounded him of a sort of so-called moderate or official uh, uh, Islamic leaders in Tatarstan in uh, 2000, I think it was 2011. I might be wrong on that date, maybe it was 2012, something like that. Um, and there was, a, after following that, uh, the federal forces did come in and crack down, and so um, there have been other reports of growing tensions in the region, although probably nothing uh, along the lines, not, not nearly the same magnitude of what we've seen in the North Caucasus. Okay, so putting all this together, just as background, the question I want to address is to what extent do Russia's Muslims represent a distinct political community, political community or a distinct community in terms of their political views and you know their social attitudes as well. And I think one could sort of come up with three hypotheses going into this, given this history. So one is you might expect extremism. That's the sort of I label it caliphate uh, in the title. But you know, it could be for a variety of reasons that Russian Muslims tend to be more oppositional to the regime, more unhappy about their circumstances, more critical of, of regime policies across the board. You know, it could be that you know, we do know that there have been attempts to radicalize Russia's Muslims from uh, various extremist uh, groups that work internationally. Uh, there have been homegrown insurgencies, as we know, in Chechnya and Dagestan and other places. Uh, the Russian response has not always been, to put it mildly, very, uh, very uh, subtle. And uh, the, 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 the violence uh, directed against Muslims by Russian forces could arguably radicalize not only the direct victims of that, but um, other Muslims who have seen this happening, who sympathize with the victims um, in, the, in places like uh, Ingushetia, Chechnya, Dagestan. Um, the regional economic and political problems in the Muslim regions uh, are quite pronounced and quite serious, and they could also, could so the things, it certainly makes sense, and you know, people have argued to quote some um, quite strongly in D.C. that you know we really should be worried about this growing radicalism of Russia's Muslims that they 
you know, threaten regional stability and that they're, they're going to be prone to uh, various types of radical movements and cause a lot of problems for Russia and by extension for the West writ large. Right? So that's one perspective. Then there's sort of uh, the perspective that I think, uh, you know, perhaps is, you're starting to hear people talk about this, but the rise of Kadyrov, you know, people, uh, analysts have sort of thought, well, okay, Kadyrov, okay, it's a, he's Putin's creation, and Putin now, you know, now that he's, now that Putin is created, we can't control him, we thought he can control him. But no one really asked, well, how, how do Muslims think about Kadyrov? I mean, is, is, are Kadyrov's ideas sort of a, a model uh, that they can get behind, and I don't see why not. Why should we reject in advance? Because you know, after all, he, he he might be viewed as someone who's brought stability and order, who does sort of uh, promote the the social conservatism that perhaps many Muslims would be sympathetic with. Um, he does sort of instill a kind of um, ethno-religious pride, uh, and he promotes. Uh, you know, traditional dress and traditional dances and traditional music. And okay, so if you're not a Chechen, maybe you don't uh, think that's so great. But but in principle, he could be seen as proposing a viable alternative to the extreme jihadist types, because clearly he's done what he can to thwart them, to block them, to put them down. And yet, um, he's not. You know, he he sort of is halfway between a fully assimilationist, uh, shall we say, approach where. You know, he says, "Well, we should all just be like, like Russians, like like everybody else." Um, so he try he, he tries to walk a line between sort of succumbing to assimilation, and full integration, um, but he's also effective at you know keeping out the more radical extremist elements. So you know, I think it's quite plausible that Russian Muslims might find this as an alternative, attractive model. And then there's the Kasha argument, and I and I. I call it kasha because, well, you know, Russians like to eat kasha, and uh, maybe Muslim, uh, Russian Muslims also like to eat kasha. So, so that's basically the idea that, you know, really, after centuries of integration into Russian society, and after, you know, the Soviet period, and, you know, despite all the efforts by external forces, and by, you know, the, the misguided efforts, uh, or the ham-handed efforts of the Russian authorities to suppress the violent extremism, you know, perhaps there, there's still the case that by and large, Russians, Muslims really don't differ that much from Russians in terms of their distribution of their views. They don't really represent a distinctive community in terms of their attitudes. Um, you know, of course, you're going to find some who are extremists. Of course, you're going to find some who are conservative. You're going to find some who are moderate. Well, Russian society itself is actually quite diverse with respect to a lot of political and social issues, and so maybe you'll find the same thing. And that's actually what uh, uh, Sarah Mendelson and I found, a study that we, uh, we did in the late 2000s. We did a survey in uh, Kabardino-Balkaria, Dagestan, and North Ossetia, and we were, we were really try interested in, it was really focused on young people, and we ended up only surveying men because of various reasons. And uh, so we looked at young men in that region, and by and large, we were looking for signs of growing radicalism, of you know extremism, and so forth. We didn't find any. What we found is that if you compare the distributions of responses to a range of questions about support for the Russian government, about you know, what the types of concerns that motivated people, about views, and if you looked at questions about the role of Islam in politics in their regions, we really didn't find. Uh, that, so so we, we found you know, there wasn't a lot of support for you know, anything like a radical agenda, radical uh, Islamization of politics. And with a lot of political variables, the distributions of views were quite similar among Muslims in those regions as they were in a, a similar national sample we had from a similar period of time. So that's the Kasha perspective. Okay. Um, so why do we care about this? Well, I mean, I think the Russian government you know, would do well to be quite concerned about the, the Muslim population because of potential for instability. So, uh, central immigration is a big problem, and as Marlette and others have pointed out, it's a, it's a, it's a basic structural problem because on the one hand you have the rise of anti-immigrant sentiment among the ethnic Russian population, but at the same time Russia really needs 
Central Asian immigrants, despite the economic woes that are going to continue to affect the country, uh, for geopolitical reasons, because Russia is is uh, is uh, placing a lot of emphasis on uh, this uh, uh, customs union, and it really needs to open the borders and continue to encourage you know why you, you can't really have a customs union if you don't have free exchange of labor as well as goods. Uh, although, well, I guess the U.S. does that. It tries to do that anyway. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so, so for G both geopolitical and economic reasons, it needs immigration. There's going to be increasing, you know, numbers of migrant flows over the foreseeable future. Uh, the Syria campaign, of course, raises the issue that you know we, we shouldn't rule out that that the Muslim population in Russia might be upset by the fact that Russian arms are being used to uh, bomb and attack uh, uh, Muslims in Syria. Uh, terrorism, it had been. Uh, I don't need to tell this audience, many terrorist attacks in Russia can continue to be a problem. Um, yeah, the Stop Feeding the Caucasus slogan, so many, so it's not just the immigrants uh, from Central Asia and the Caucasus that, the, the, the South Caucasus that Russians are upset about, there's a, a popular slogan that uh, suggests that there are many Russians who themselves think that too many federal resources go to supporting uh, the republics of the North Caucasus. Um, there are reports of Chechen volunteers and Chechen forces being sent to fight uh, in Ukraine, on both sides actually, but by and large on the pro-Russian side. Uh, but there were some on both sides. And there's of course issues of federal sovereignty. No state can afford to have, but you know, what if the governor of Texas said, well, if those FBI agents come here, they're going to have a, you know, you, 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 you know, clearly that's a major challenge to any government when you have a local leader, you know, declaring that uh, the, its troops are not welcome on, on his net. And so, so it's a big issue, but there's very little public opinion data. And also, I think it's important uh, that, you know, oftentimes we discuss Muslims in general. So I'm going to argue, and I actually present some evidence suggesting that <coughs> it is important to distinguish the North Caucasus from the Volga regions in terms of looking at the views of the Muslim population. So. Uh, our project, it's actually, a, the broader study is, and I'm not gonna, I'll just give you a very cursory overview. We're, we're interested in how people's housing conditions, uh, their, whether or not they're homeowners, the quality and quality of their housing, how they affect their levels of civil, civic engagement, the extent of their grievances, both against the government and against other social groups, their ideology, their political ideology, and their, regime, their levels of regime support. And this research was funded by the Minerva Research Initiative of the Army Research Office, I should point out. So we, we did a study, we did the study actually of four countries, um, and we sort of <coughs> tried to get variants along several different dimensions, um, uh, which as you can see, so we thought, you know, in terms of political economy, you have low resource, and less authoritarian, <laughs> low resource, more democratic, I hope these are a natural correlation, but you know, more democratic but poorer versus richer but more authoritarian uh, countries. And then, you know, we, we were, we're sociologists who are interested in things like gender norms and the relationship between housing as a source of uh, patriarchy and home ownership as a source of gender division. So we also wanted more traditionalistic uh, countries in terms of gender and then less so. And so our four countries are Kyrgyzstan, Azerbaijan, Ukraine, and Russia. And today I'm just going to present uh, the data from Russia. So in each of the, so we did focus groups in each of the countries, uh, looking at housing issues and also looking at the political issues. Uh, but then the, the main crux of our study is surveys that we did in early 2015. Um, and so in each country we had uh, a general representative sample of about 2,000 people in Azerbaijan. We couldn't work in the rural areas, so it was only urban, but elsewhere it's national representative. And then in each country we also had oversample. So in Russia, we oversampled four Muslim regions precisely because we were interested in you know, trying to generate a large enough sample of Muslims to see if Muslims differ from non-Muslims along all these dimensions, housing and so forth. Um, and so the, the survey in Russia was conducted from late January, essentially February through May, although most, so I should know, so uh, Dagestan is not the easiest place to survey, and, and the, the Levada Center with whom I worked for many years, they don't have an office there, but they do, so they've, uh, they, they, in fact, the first time they surveyed there was in 2000. 
eight, the surah that I did with Sarah Mendelssohn that I talked about before. But they've been doing it increasingly, but they, they did have a problem. So the initial round of data collection didn't go very well in Dagestan, um, but quality control uh, revealed that there were some issues with the sample. There were some questions about the uh, reliability of some of the interviewers. So they decided to throw it out and just start all over again with a different provider. And they actually ended up sending in people from Kabri and Walkaria to do the work in Dagestan. Um, so it took a little bit while longer in Russia precisely because that. So, so our four regions in Russia are Dagestan, Kabri and Balkaria, Tatarstan, and Bosch Kordistan. And we had about 100 uh, respondents in each one of those. Now they're not all Muslims, but we did generate a sizable, between that and the rest of our survey, we ended up with uh, 407 Muslim respondents of 2,401 total. So enough to at least get a little bit of statistical power to make some uh, claims. So note that in our main sample, we also, so, so the way sampling works, you, uh, I don't have time, but you, you, you sort of randomly sample regions, and then within the regions, you randomly sample districts. And, but, you know, Dagestan, Kabarnia, Balkaria, and Karachayo, no, and also the other two, they all fell into the normal sample. Uh, and the oversample which just gave us extra respondents in those regions. And um, uh, so we also got, you know, some Muslims in Karachayvo Chakesia, in Adige, and, and then other throughout, you know, the rest of the country, you know, Mishmash in different places. Now, this is something I, that I, I seek your guidance on. So, so we wanted to distinguish between North Caucasus uh, Muslims and then other Muslims. Now, we, we, might, we might, in the next phase analysis, tease out Bashkortistan and Tatarstan, the Volga regions, as distinct. But we were sort of not really sure, like, who should really consider to be North Caucasus? Well, okay, we could use the whole, we could treat, you know, Muslims living in Stavropol and Krasnodar, even Rostov, uh, certainly Adigya. Uh, we could treat them as North Caucasus Muslims, because they, like, factually they are. But we thought, well, Conditions in those places really aren't the same as the conditions in uh, Chechnya, Dagestan, Gushetia, Kavni, and Balkaria, uh, even Karachayva, Chekhesia, there's been a little bit of radicalization. So we thought we really wanted to tease out not just any, not, not just use a sort of a blind you know, geographic approach, but treat as North Caucasus the, the regions where we thought there was reason to expect a, a distinctive perspective. And that, those were, so, you know, we'll test this, but I, I welcome your thoughts on that decision. So that's what we did, for better or worse, for what I'm going to show you now, is we treat Dagestan, Kabardino, Balkaria, and Karachayla, Chekhesia as the North Caucasus regions and the others, even though Stavropol, Kras, uh, Krasnodar, and so forth, are, are in the North Caucasus, uh, we, we, we treat them as in the other category. Okay, um, so this shows you uh, the ethnic identification. So, you know, part of the challenge of doing this is that there's so much of a strong correlation between ethnic identity and uh, religion that it's really hard to say. So, you know, among the Muslims in the North Caucasus, they all identify different peoples in the North Caucasus. So, you know, if they're distinct, is it because they're Muslim or is it because they're Chechens or... Uh, Lesbians or whatever group, uh, you know, then there's hundreds of different peoples of the North Caucasus, as I'm sure you all know quite well. So I'm just pointing out that, you know, that, that's always going to lead to some interpretive ambiguity, and I'm not really sure, you know, particularly with respect to the North Caucasus groups, if we could do that short of having a massive survey where you interview you know, thousands and thousands of Muslims in those regions, and you can really tease out the different, the different peoples of the North Caucasus as opposed to just we're lumping them all together, as we do. All right, so what do we find? Well, I'm just going to run through a whole bunch of very simple, this is a very non-technical talk. I'm just going to show you descriptive statistics, uh, our first brush. But so what about, let's start with support for Putin. So we ask people, you know, do you support Putin? If so, how much? And his popularity rating has been very high. And I'm going to distinguish in what I show you the North Caucasus Muslims in the light blue, the other Muslims in the dark blue, and then the non-Muslims you know, not all of whom are ethnic Russians, but many of whom are, in the sort of uh, green or turquoise color. And uh, so right away we see that actually this is some evidence for the Kadyrovist uh, perspective, in that the North Caucasus Muslims 
are more likely to strongly support Putin as opposed to somewhat, or trust support, you know, it's hard to, it's, uh, uh, to what extent does he deserve trust or Davieli or confidence. Um, they're even more likely to strongly support Putin, near 60%, than the non-Muslim populations, whereas the uh, other Muslims who don't live in those three North Caucasus republics, they're somewhat less supportive. So, you know, that suggests that Kadyrov's repeated and, you know, exa hyperbolic expressions of loyalty to Putin, maybe they are rubbing off to the local population, you know, Muslims anyway. Um, and and uh, that's evidence. So, so, so there is a distinction. It also shows that we really do, when you're talking about Russia's Muslims, we should distinguish between uh, the North Caucasus and the non-North Caucasus ones, because they have distinctive views. Perhaps a little bit counterintuitive. I mean, it's certainly counterintuitive to this sort of extremist, like if, yeah, if we're, we're looking at a surging movement for uh, a caliphate in the Caucasus, you're not going to see like all this support for Putin. It just it runs counter to that, uh, that perspective, I think, quite clearly. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at sort of more localized political institutions, a different picture emerges. So we also ask about levels of trust in the police, in the courts, in banks, and in local government. And here we see that the North Caucasus Muslims tend to be a little bit less trusting. So this is just showing the percent who, are, who say they don't deserve trust, these institutions. So the police, some are higher. Courts are substantially higher. Banks are so, you know, we know about Islam, but there's this this principles against usury and so forth. So it's it's a little bit reassuring that the data, you know, might might actually be valid that we find that Muslims both in the North Caucasus and elsewhere tend to be more uh, untrusting of banks. Um, local government, there's not a whole lot of variation, but all right, so it's not it's not a clear uniform picture by any means. Um, so a general question about the, dire the direction of the country, here we don't really don't see much variation. So this is more consistent with that Kasha perspective. You see distribution of views. So the question is, you know, a standard political science question, is the country heading in the right direction? Or do you agree or disagree with this statement? The country is heading in the right direction. Um, so it's really uh, very scant differences by religious affiliation and region. Um, so, you know, we don't see like massive, massively more discontent among the Muslim populations, nor are they massively more satisfied. They really just resemble the non-Muslim population, both in the Caucasus and elsewhere. Um, okay, so that's the first set of results about sort of regime support, trust in Putin, trust in institutions. What about foreign affairs? So, here we have more evidence of the distinctiveness of the North Caucasus Muslims. So there's just a standard question, like how do you assess Russia's foreign policies? And the North Caucasus Muslims are more likely to assess them very positively than uh, somewhat positively. Um, so, you know, they stand out. And more specific questions, so we ask questions about Ukraine. We ask who's to blame for the conflict and then should the Russian government support the separatists materially. And uh, uh, the North Caucasus Muslims are, are more likely to blame the United States, uh, somewhat less likely to blame the Ukrainian government. So, so we said, which part, the question was, who, which of the following parties is mostly to blame, you know, more than any other, for the problems in Ukraine? You know, the Ukrainian government, the American government, the Russian government, we had like the EU, the separatists themselves. Uh, I think I think those were the you know, other, and then declined to respond. And uh, you know, almost nobody in Russia blames the Russian government. You know, uh, the Ukraine, it's you know, everybody blames the Russian government. Not everybody, but the, um, in fact, I think I have that slide. I'll show you the next, uh, just for the case. Uh, but so the point is, is that the. For, I, you know, I don't really know quite what to make of this. So the, the North Caucasus Muslims are more likely to blame the U.S., less likely to blame Ukraine. Um, but other than that, you know, there's not a lot much <coughs> going on. So here, just, just for curiosity, uh, this is that same question, the distribution. All right, so these are our five categories. The uh, Ukrainian government, Russian government, American government, European Union, the separatists. And these are the four countries overall with 
you know, using weights to correct for those oversamples. And so, I mean, I just think it's how is striking. You almost never seen this in survey research. Um, so, you know, Ukraine, 59 percent, the modal response blame the Russian government. Um, there are some who blame the separatists. Almost very few blaming the United States or or uh, 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 the Ukrainian government. The opposite in Russia, but. You know, unless we think that there's some sort of Muslim country tendency, it's interesting to compare Azerbaijan and Kyrgyzstan. So the Azeris are, tend to blame the Russian government, although there's a more even distribution. That's the modal response, 35% say Russian is to blame. Whereas in Kyrgyzstan, uh, it's much more closer with the, the official Russian line. They tend to blame the Ukrainian government or the United States government. Very few blame Russia. Okay, so I just thought... That's a little <laughs> silent. All right, so back to Russia's uh, Muslims. So in, in terms of should Russia materially support the Ukrainian separatists in eastern Ukraine, uh, we have uh, North Caucasus Muslims more likely to say they should. Um, not, but whereas, if anything, the other Muslims are less likely to say so. So again, that division, and again, that's you know, consistent with sort of Kadyrov being really a uh, cheerleader for Putin and his foreign policy, uh, aggressive foreign policies. Um, we asked about a series of countries that I'll show you. How is this country uh, in relation to Russia? Is it an enemy, a competitor, or a rival, I think I would say, instead of competitor, a neutral, a neutral country, or a partner, or an ally? And uh, uh, we don't see much going on with respect to the United States. Uh, there's not much variation. Maybe. Uh, the other Muslims slightly less likely to see the U.S. as an enemy, and by and large, Russian society. It's a high numbers, unprecedentedly high numbers, as you probably read. Uh, but other countries, we see more variation. So, uh, North Caucasus Muslims jump out in terms of the high percentage. You see Ukraine as an enemy of Russia, and the same goes for Georgia. So, North Caucasus Muslims, you know, quite. You know, pronounced number, see Georgia as an enemy or as a competitor, whereas the opposite is true for non-North Caucasus Muslims. Um, Iran, so they're big fans of Iran in the uh, North Caucasus, <laughs> not other Muslims, not so much, or at least not, you know, not that much different from uh, the non-Muslim Russians. Um, what about, so then we asked them about feelings towards other groups, not countries, but groups. So we asked them how they feel about Russians, about Americans, and about Uzbeks. And there's not a lot of variation with respect to uh, Russians. You know, maybe the other Muslims, if anything, you know, slightly more neutral, less uh, uh, positive towards Russians. But the North Caucasus, Russians seem to be perfectly just, just as keen on Russians as other groups. Um, Americans, so this is a little bit against the grain of the other findings. If anything, the North Caucasus Muslims are more positive, more likely to be very positive towards Americans as people. This is not the country. You know, again, I don't really know how I would account for that. But not, not other variations between Muslims and non-Muslims. Um, towards Uzbeks, North Caucasus Muslims like uh, Uzbeks more than uh, the non-Muslims do. We're more likely to feel positive for them. Um, and then a few domestic issues. I'm almost done by this. So, so thank you for your patience and indulgence. So um, we asked the question, how, how would you characterize relationships between ethnic Russians and Muslims where you live? And of course I should really break this down regionally more than by, but just this interesting to see. So actually the North Caucasus Muslims tend to characterize those relationships as good. So they're living in the North Caucasus, where there's been all this pure over, you know, religious-based extremism and the Russian government response and violence. But they're more likely to characterize relationships between themselves and Russians as good, very good or friendly, um, certainly far more than, you know, the, the non-Muslim population in Russia overall. But Interestingly enough, also substantially, significantly more than Muslims who live elsewhere. Um, you know, the non-Muslims are more likely to say either neutral or to say very bad, acrimonious. Um, okay. 
uh, we asked questions, so what kinds of you know, people would you not want to have as neighbors? Because this is a question about housing. So we're trying to get, we're trying to think of other ways to get into sort of prejudices and things. And uh, the, uh, the, the North Caucasus Muslims are less anti-immigrant in terms of they, they say they don't want to have an immigrant as neighbor. A bit more anti-homosexual, so you know, overall the society, over 50% of Russians, they don't want a homosexual as a neighbor. And it's more pronounced among the Muslim populations. But again, you could interpret this as you know, support for the social conservatism that Kadyrov is promoting as well, and as uh, Putin's regime has also promoted. Okay, uh, I think I'm almost. I think this is the last one. So uh, we had a question about a number. So I'm going to show you a list of things where there's not any variation at all. This is the last one where there's some variation, and the question was, how important is a strong opposition for our country to flourish? And I thought this was relevant because Kadyrov has gone to such great lengths to criticize the opposition, and to say they should be shot, and their enemies, the people, and so forth. And you do see that there, ironically, uh, is more support for a strong opposition among the North Caucasus <laughs> Muslims, but at the same time, they're also more likely to say that it's unimportant to have a strong opposition. But still, only 9% you know, say it's unimportant. So that sort of runs counter. Uh, although if you think of it in terms of rel in relative terms, they're more likely than non-Muslims to say, uh, we don't need an opposition. But it's still only a very small percentage actually agree with that. Uh, other variables we looked at, I don't put them up, but they, they really don't show much variation at all. Uh, not any statistically significant variation by these criteria. So attitudes towards legal rights, towards civil liberties, towards media freedom, uh, extent of civic engagement in terms of membership in NGOs of various types or other types of organizations, and then economic ideology. We have a lot of questions about you know, socialism versus capitalism, to put it bluntly, and we don't see much effect of the Muslim non-Muslim divide on those distributions. And there's heterogeneous views in the sample with respect to all these questions. So, um, although a lot of the media discussions you hear, well, Russians all believe this, or Russians are all this, or uh, the only thing around the, uh, the only two questions in the whole survey around which there's anything like a near consensus is support for Putin, and even that, there's a difference between strong support and, and moderate support, and then the perception of the United States as an enemy or a rival. Aside from that, there's still a lot of disagreement in the Russian public. Okay, so bringing it all together, it seems to me, and it seems based on this preliminary analysis, that the views of Russia's Muslims are diverse, as are the views of non-Muslims. And that Muslims in the North Caucasus, they do tend to be distinct with respect to their average views from Muslims, uh, from, from both non-Muslims in Russia and Muslims elsewhere in Russia. So, I think it's important moving forward that we preserve this analytical distinction. I mean, really, if we're looking at this topic, that researchers, you know, us and others who want to look at, should really carefully distinguish Muslims who are living in the North Caucasus from those who live elsewhere. But rather than being more radicalized or more critical, they seem to be, by and large, more supportive of Putin and his, particularly his foreign policies, a few of his domestic policies. So, I think, you know, I mean, I'm not going to... I'm not going to uh, come out swinging too hard with this argument yet, but I do think there is some evidence that you know, Kadyrov has had some appeal. His, he could be perceived as representing a, a viable alternative, which is different from supporting jihad, extremism, you know, insurgency against the Russian government. It's a different mode. Uh, I mean, it's not necessarily you know, consistent with all the goals of the Kremlin, but it's a, a different animal than you know this classic Muslim extremism, so to speak. At the same time, they're more critical of other government institutions and, and also the overall state of the country. So there is some tentative evidence of rising Kadyrovism in the region. And Muslims elsewhere, we really don't see much difference between Muslims residing elsewhere in Russia and non-Muslims. So overall, the differences between the Muslim, the sub -pop, both Muslim subpopulations and Muslim, non-Muslims in Russia tend to be fairly muted. Um, I don't think, you know, looking at these data, they don't jump at me, out at me, saying, you know, that 
Muslims really are a distinctive political community. The divisions within them along these two you know, regional lines are, are in many cases stronger than the differences between either of them and the non-Muslim population. But to the extent there are differences, it's important to keep that regional uh, distinction you know, forefront in our understanding of those differences. So a few words on next steps. So we do need to you know, do some multivariate analyses. It's obviously the next step we need to control for other individual and contextual factors that shape views of the regime, support for Putin, views of the U.S., the foreign policy, and so forth. Um, I just started doing some of this last night, uh, or this morning, just to look at it. Uh, and so far, it looks like, by and large, you control for all these factors, and the patterns are still there. Uh, I haven't, in what I presented today, teased out the difference between region, ethnicity, and religion. So it's really hard with ethnicity. With region, we can do a little bit. So we do have a lot of non-Muslims, not a lot, but we have some non-Muslims who live in the North Caucasus in our sample. And the question is, is that a regional effect? Are people in the North Caucasus, including the Muslims, do they support Putin more and so forth? And maybe the experience of, of uh, conflict and strife has pushed them in the direction of being more supportive of the center of a strong state. Um, we can look at Muslims versus non-Muslims in Kyrgyzstan and Azerbaijan as well in our data. Uh, we can try different ways of aggregating the groups, so maybe I should throw in the Stavropol. There's only a handful of Muslims in Stavropol and, and um, Krasnodar and Adyghen. As you can see, we can put them in with the North Caucasus groups or not. Um, and, but overall, overall, I think you know, what I want to make a case for is that there should be more efforts for analysts of Russian society, Russian politics, uh, who are doing survey work to uh, try to make a point of understanding you know, whether or not Muslims do represent a distinctive political community and if so, what the divisions among Muslims are within Russia. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> It's really great to have some quantitative data that we can articulate to the kind of qualitative or anecdotal evidence we have for the, the region. Let's open the floor for some questions. Don't be shy. Yes, Sabina. Um, Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Sabina in Survivor. I'm mm -hmm. the GW Visiting Fellow. I have several questions. Sure. And let me start with the division between Muslims and non-Muslims. Like we know that Muslims uh, can be divided into Muslims that follow their religious practices and those that can uh, that consider themselves to be a Muslims but do not follow the religious practices. So how can you draw the lines between mus Muslimness um, in Russia? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. We do have a question uh, which I haven't yet looked at. So indeed, that is something that I should add that to the next step uh, because the. Your, your question makes me think of that. We did ask people, and we actually went over this because, um, you know, in the U.S. and other con in Christian contexts, you often measure religiosity in an objective way by saying how often do you attend services. But um, our colleagues in Pakistan said, well, that's not necessarily a good measure of religiosity for for Muslims. Um, and you know, so based on that, we have it's just a subjective measure. You know, how, how would people characterize themselves? Um, in terms of how uh, how strongly I think how we said how strongly does religion religion influence your or how big a role does religion play in your life or something like that um, and so we can use that to see if that is another source of variation apart from this I mean it'd be interesting just to look at that to see you know, are they are indeed the Muslims in, um, in the North Caucasus more uh, did they say it plays a larger role in their lives? But yeah, I mean, we could use that also to do a similar set of analyses, and that's a great idea that for some reason escaped me <laughs> prior to preparing this. So thanks for the question. I mean, I don't know, you know, surveys, you know, people always say, well, this question doesn't really, what about a person who actually they follow the practices, but they don't consider it to be an important part of that? How, I mean, yes, you know, you're, you're never going to, with a survey, really be able to dig down and get insight into an individual respondent's, you know, uh, uh, perspective or their orientation, their behavior. But the, I, I do think that by and large, you know, if it's true that, you know, practicing Muslims or heavily religious Muslims are different, that that should show up when you average across all this, uh, all the, the different respondents' measurement error notwithstanding. So that's a great idea to proceed further. Uh, yeah, I, I'm Gujigit, uh, uh, 
of GW um, uh -huh. fellow from Kyrgyzstan. So uh, it, it was interesting to see that uh, the so to say Muslim uh, pu public opinion is quite to tolerant to uh, civic liberties, to opposition, and it was interesting to see that there is no sort of negative correlation with uh, the support to the uh, Putin's regime. Uh, does that mean that you were gouging the m media influence on the on the uh, public opinion, or it's it's more profound? So you're saying, why do people support Putin if at the same time they support an opposition? Yeah, and civil liberties, I mean, taking account of the whole policies against that. So. I mean, the Putin support thing is a complicated phenomenon. So, so, so first of all, I'll say this, that, you know, I've done surveys in Russia for many years. I've, and I've always kind of, I mean, I'm not a political scientist. I don't, you know, it's, it's not a central interest of mine, like who supports Putin, who does. But I always looked at it, and, and consistent with what other published studies have found, it's really hard to tease out sort of classic kinds of effects you see in political regime support studies, and things like education, income. I mean, there's some evidence that women are more supportive of Putin than men have been for a long time, that rural areas are more supportive of Putin. But, you know, these effects are kind of muted. So, so it's not like he has this constituency. So in this data, um, actually I presented a, a talk upstairs uh, in February uh, looking at regime support in these four countries with a similar set of analysis. And, and I didn't have the Muslim, no, Muslim but there we were focused on uh, nationalism and sort of views of, uh, of, of nationalism. And... Um, housing conditions, and so it does turn out that housing, you know, people who are homeowners and who have better housing conditions are more supportive of, not just the Putin, but the, the government in general. Um, ideology in Russia is kind of a wash, it doesn't really matter, it matters more in some of the other uh, in countries. But um, it's a little hard, so, so it's hard to say what's driving, the way I think about it personally, and you know, probably based more on qualitative research and just some of my conversations with uh, people in Russia is that, you know, so okay, there's a hardcore of people who support Putin and who have for a long time and they truly believe in him. Then there's a core of soft supporters and then there's people who support him in the current environment because they don't know what else to do because, you know, they if they don't believe in Putin, what else are they going to believe in? And, you know, times are getting difficult. There's a lot of pressures both economic, political, social, and the country. And so a lot of Russians, I think, are grasping at Putin because psychologically it's just hard to know what else they could, uh, they could hold on to to give them hope uh, for the future, the near future, and the far future. Now, how that would relate to this Muslim effect, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe, I mean, maybe it is, it really is Kadir. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, but I, why not, you know, what other explanation would there be why the North Caucasus Muslims would be particularly prone to strongly have strong trust in Putin, other than Kadir? I mean, even, I mean, we're not we're not interviewing in Chechnya. These are in Dagestan, like the Dagestan. You know, maybe they look at Chechnya with everything that's happened. You know, they see. They, so, so first of all, like, let's posit that most of the Muslims there are, don't support extremism and they don't want the jihad and they think that these guys are coming in and causing a lot of trouble, and so Kadira put an end to that, right? And yeah, he's kind of extreme, and yeah, maybe he kills some oppositionists, and maybe he does this or that, or he has this, he likes animals, whatever. You know, he may not be perfect, but flawed though he is, they look at him as somebody who's actually saw the problem, meanwhile extracting a lot of resources from the federal government, building these beautiful parks and water parks and zoos and so forth in Grozny, you know, restoring it from rubble. And sure, you know, why can't I have that? You know, so, so, and he says he likes Putin. Well, great, yeah, so Putin must be okay. I mean, I don't know, it's at least a, a plausible account for that. Um, yeah, if I can just sure. add, maybe the specificity of the Putin's regime is to, to dissociate the president from the institutions. So everybody in Russia will consider the institution as dysfunctional, but the leader mm -hmm. is the leader, and the leader is not responsible for the institution. On the contrary, the leader is the only thing that makes the country functional, 
or the institutions are dysfunctional. So in fact, you can have a population that is totally in support of Putin precisely because they are totally distrustful of the institution, so that the contrary of what you would imagine for a Western political system where we would consider the leader responsible for the failure of the institution. So I think yeah. it's just no, the I, image I, yeah. Of, yeah. I completely agree with you in terms of the institution, but, but the question, but, but the puzzling thing, I agree it's a puzzle, I don't, but the puzzling thing is, so, so we, you know, in the West, the United States, we think, oh, Putin is such an autocrat, and he's rolled back civil liberties, he's cracked down the opposition, he's limited the, fright, the right to protest, he's put protesters in jail, he's done this and that. And you would think that if that's the case, that the Russians who, that, that there should be a correlation between the Russians who support, or between support for civil liberties, for a healthy opposition, for free and fair elections, and views of Putin, that the, the Russians who are more supportive of protests as a form of political expression, who are more supportive of free and fair elections, who are more, you know, that they would be more anti-Putin. But you don't really find that. that, that that's what's puzzling from the, the sort of standard narrative about Putin that we have in the West, that, you know, maybe it's just that they, I mean, they say they support these issues, but they really just don't care that much about them. They care more about, you know, making Russia great, and economic well-being, and yeah, okay, it would be nice if Putin weren't so hard on the protesters, but that's not a mm. that's not going to drive my concern. So that that would be mm. another way to answer the question that these these kinds of civil liberties and political rights they're just not that central uh, to Russians' uh, uh, standards or criteria for uh, for assessing their leaders. Yeah, and also because of the absence of uh, political uh, process in, uh, in the country, uh, who, if not Putin, who, if mm. not Kadyrov, and there are answers to that, if not Putin, it's Medvedev, if not Kadyrov, it's Delimkhanov. Mm. Uh, right. When, when uh, Kadyrov announced that uh, I'm done, I will retire, he, he uh, offered uh, to replace him with Adam Delimkhanov, his cousin who is a killer and he like uh, doesn't even uh, conceal that so does it doesn't conceal that <laughs> yeah so so that's your he doesn't pose uh, with, fuzzy, with fuzzy kitty cats and, uh, <laughs> that's, that's the guy who uh, represents chechnya in uh, russian state duma and once he was in quarrel with another member of it's parliament and, 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 a, and a golden gun fall out of his pocket inside of the parliament so that's the guy <laughs> who is alternative to Kadyrov. <laughs> so the, 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 that's another thing. They, the, the, there is no, uh, there's no, there's no uh, alternative there's no. other than what Putin Kadyrov uh, they uh, offer, and uh, people uh, mm. like think it will be only worse. And that golden gun is a gift from Kadyrov, which he gives to a lot of his lieutenants. He gives him the golden gun. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that uh, state funding is going. Ted, I was wondering, do you have also survey about media influence? Because when you had the number about the fact that the U.S. are seen as an enemy even higher than for the majority Russian, I saw that in fact it's probably also because you have two media influence meeting in the North Caucasus, which is the Russian one and the kind of Islamic one in a very general sense of the fact that if you are a Muslim and you just go on internet towards several Muslim websites, Islamic in a very general sense. The general narrative coming from the Islamic world would be also that the U.S. are responsible for everything. So in fact, you have the encountering a of two anti-U.S. Uh, narratives that are separated for, that but that in fact they converge, that you have generally in the Muslim world, because of all the literature coming from the Middle East, all this notion that the U.S. are responsible for everything, plus Israel and so on. And probably if you had question about relationship to Jews and so on, you would see some kind of, of uh, uh, Muslim anti-Semitism emerging for geopolitical mm. reason, you know, kind of just anti-Israel. Yeah, so I mean, that, that. So, so, I mean, we, I, I think you're right. We don't have that in this data for Russia. I mean, we do have, we do have, you have it for we have for Kyrgyzstan, yeah. right. Um, and, you know, we have, uh, so we are working with a graduate student mm. who suggests that there is there is some influence of Russian media consumption mm -hmm. in Kyrgyzstan on particular views of foreign policy of, of you know the Ukraine conflict, views of the U.S. Less so about views of Russia as mm -hmm. such, and that kind of makes sense because probably Kyrgyz have other sources of information about Russia than the media. 
that they the experience of migrants and other you know families who migrate and so forth or their own travels there. Uh, but I do have earlier data, and that actually makes me think. So I did a survey around the elections, the Duma elections and presidential elections in 2000. 11 and 12, we have very extensive media consumption variables there. Um, and we didn't ask specific channels or websites or anything like that, but we have a lot of measures of both web-based and uh, traditional media-based frequency of media consumption for various purposes. And um, we have, so it's a large, pretty large sample. So I could go and check, go back and look at that, uh, those data and see if there's something going on with the Muslim respondents there mm -hmm. because there's enough of a sample that I can probably tease out some kind of effect. That's a good idea, actually. Because I hadn't thought about that angle that, yeah, they're yeah. getting the propaganda from. I the, think the also, news. I don't know, that's my impression that probably the North Caucasian would be more aware of, for example, the Palestinian issues because that has been more presented in mirror with what was happening in the 90s for them than for the rest of Muslim of Russia or the Central Asians when we have data. And nobody in Central Asia care really about Palestinian. I mean, uh, it's just outside the, 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 the thing. They care about Uzbek in Southern Kyrgyzstan. Nobody cares about the, the Palestinians. So they don't have this global narrative about Muslim being victimized and so on. But they have it. They don't cannot name it, but they have it in general, but the North Caucasian, because it has been more internationalized in the 90s, they, they may have this aspect of, you know, solidarity with the Muslim right. world that the other Muslim would have, wouldn't have, so. Right, 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 that, that'd be interesting that to see. Be you could tease that out with the Jews, with the Shrek mm -hmm. so you have questions on the other side of the Jews, and yeah. it's a good idea. Yeah, I, uh, you mentioned this uh, report uh, by uh, International uh, Ice Ekaterina Sakirianska that, ah. uh, uh, that uh, analyzed why the number of acts of violence decreased after yes. such Olympic uh, in 2014 and 2015. Let's not like uh, uh, say it's because of such Olympics or something. Anyway, so uh, in the, this report uh, has two options, uh, two. Um, Explanations. One explanation is effective work of the, uh, the Secretary Services of Russia uh, in, before and during uh, Sochi Olympics. And another explanation is the exodus of uh, the insurgents to Jeez. Syria, and so that. Like, but uh, uh, it, the, did did you have like any uh, question? Uh, how people view uh, why the number of acts of violence decreased in 2014 and 15 because that's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, the most crucial thing, it decreased. In the, and uh, uh, what the report doesn't mention is uh, how the locals would uh, think about it. And uh, this may be kind of counterintuitive for a political scientist sociologist to analyze, but uh, like the blame in America for Ukrainian conflict is also counterintuitive, but that's what people think. So uh, I, I was wondering, uh, the locals could think that the decrease of acts of violence uh, were due, was due because of uh, the law enforcement and secret services w went away from the Caucasus, not the insurgents the left, mm -hmm. thing, but, but the, the, the law enforcement went yeah, away. Yeah, so they kind of went, uh, the, 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 the priority went to Ukraine and they, uh, they, they stayed, uh, like, uh, pressured the local society less and there was less response of violence. So, do you have be, any... In, you know, I, I don't in the data at all, no, I don't, and I, but I, I think that's a very, it would be very fascinating to ask the locals precisely this question. Yeah, who, who, you, why it decreased? Like, right, why do you think the violence went down? Yeah. Well, be actually because the, I mean, it, it, that reminds me of a, a, a conversation I had at another meeting uh, in recent months uh, where I was commenting on the fact that hate crimes had gone down too according to the Savas Center which tracks these 
they've gone down, you know, quite steadily since 2011, but especially like in the last 2014, 2015. And I thought, well, gee, you know, maybe they're, I mean, because this was in the context, I was suggesting, well, yeah, I think the Russian government is worried about right-wing extremism, and they're cracking down, and the number of prosecutions have gone up, so there is uh, skinhead violence and so forth. Um, and, but then my, my interlocutor said to me, well, actually, it could also be that all, all the, the, the violent thugs who are doing these types of crimes, and they went to East to Donbass to you know, fight Ukrainians instead. And so it was a similar t a parallel type of argument um, uh, that, that it was more, you know, had to do with that. But I mean, I, I don't know the answer to your question, mm -hmm. and I think it would be, yeah, it would it'd be, be interesting great, yeah. to explore yeah. um, how the, the locals perceive that. Or are they even aware that the, I mean, you know, is it yeah. so palpable? Do, do they think life is better now than it was, you know, two years ago? And in a, another comment that I had, uh, you were talking about Kadyrov, and usually when uh, talking about Kadyrov, like his actions are analyzed in a very rational way, like kind of contract between Putin and Kadyrov, mm -hmm. and he like uh, does everything uh, rationally, like doesn't matter negative or positive, but rational. Mm -hmm. But when you um, like analyze his actions, he's a young man. He's a lucky guy. Uh, uh, suddenly, like he became, became this, uh, this almost wor world, uh, wor yeah, wor wor worldwide recognized and anything. And uh, so, I would say Putin is more cal calculative, less trusting, etc. And when I would analyze Kadyrov as a local, I would recognize a lot of very, very positive. Uh, Positive thinking, positive not in the way good, mm -hmm. but in the way that uh, inclusive. So, for example, uh, people who were fighting uh, insurgents, he invited them from the uh, woods, and now they joined them. Putin would never do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he he co-opted a lot of yeah, the but, Putin, but Putin did it with Kadira. But Kadira, <laughs> but, but he did do it with Kadira. Yeah, Kadira but, also but, fought against the. Yeah. Uh, but, but that was kind of exception. Yeah, okay. So While that everywhere exception. else, Putin trusts only people who he knew from childhood. <laughs> uh, in, another thing is uh, uh, like his religious views. So you mentioned uh, polygamy, uh, like, uh, but all those things are very different, mm, the, yeah. like less Islamic. For example, polygamy in Chechnya usually they have second wife. But that's not Islamic polygamy. In Islamic polygamy, you have up to four wives, and you treat them equally. Well, in Chechnya, it's not equal wives. It's replacing the old wife with a new one. So it's not so it's Islam. Traditional, it's, it's, it's traditional. It's traditional. traditional uh, yeah. uh, the, the, the same with, the same with uh, uh, religious okay. views. So the Kadir very often talks about uh, devil. No, no, not devil in... Uh, Christian uh, form, but in a devil uh, that in Muslim view every person has inside him, and so like mm, there are even techniques in the North Caucasus very popular now that you can get out to the devil. So. The devil. <laughs> yeah, so he talks about it, and I think he thinks that these oppositions and other uh, people who don't like him, etc., because he is so right, the righteous, uh, they have this devil, and somehow. <laughs> You can get the devil out of the person. You can turn the person to the right path. Mm -hmm. If you can't, like, like Kasyanov or Politkovsky, Nimtsov, yeah. those are lost people. You just kill them. Yeah. But others, told you, not, not lost. <laughs> so you can turn the person around and uh, yes, yeah. make so, him so, good. So he really does have... I mean, he's not just a crazy person with the... Yeah, he's a positive He really does have a... Uh, uh, a kind of whole philosophy of the world. And Very different from religious. Mm -hmm. So people can, you know, be brought in from the cold. Yeah, re recently Putin was asked a question about him during the... The, the, his, the uh, yeah, yeah in, uh, talk, talk, and he, he, he talked about him, like, a little bit curiously. He said, like, he said, he, he is a young man, 
He believes in what he says. So he, he, <laughs> he talked about him. He's very enthusiastic. So he talked about him uh, as if he really, really studied his worldview. And I'm sure like FSB has uh, Kadyrov under microscope. They oh, yeah. In psychology. You must keep Putin as a report. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we still had Dursuna and Naina. Um, hi, my name is Dursun. I'm also a visiting uh, fellow from Turkmenistan. Um, I also do surveys, so I was wondering, because you did mention the fact that uh, the survey sample is primarily men, right? No, no, this is, um, men, this is men and women. The one, well, we men did, the one we did in 2008 was men. Oh, okay, then, then I misunderstood. But I was just wondering, how do you justify in, in, in such cases when you have... Uh, when your survey represents specific group, specific gender category, yeah. So how how do you justify uh, the representation of, of? Yeah. Well, I mean, so so in this is not an issue here. It was so the reason why in two thousand eight we limited to to men was we we didn't have uh, part of it was that we were really interested in uh, the potential for instability, extremism. We figure well. You know, women, they can be insurgents too, they can be supportive, but you know, they're less likely to start shooting at the police than men are. I, I think it's fair to say, I mean, maybe, maybe I think I, you maybe have certain right biases. <laughs> you don't know who can They were the black widows. That's right, they were the black widows. So, Jirinovsky um, said you, we should kill Chechen women because they are the one giving birth right. <laughs> to Chechen fighter right. officers, so they, they are the, the master of the in Israel. So, okay, so, so part of it was that we were focused also, I mean, at the time, you know, we, the, so, so, and, and, I mean, I guess you, you could say, well, the why, why did he change? So at the time, in Dagestan in particular, we were concerned that it would be hard to uh, survey women in conditions where they would be allowed to you know, independently meet a stranger coming to the house and talk to them. Now, you know, okay, so you can send in female interviewers, and that's you know, ultimately what, what we did in Dagestan. But at the time, the Levada Center people were skeptical about this. They hadn't had much experience doing surveys in Dagestan in particular. And so they said, well, why don't we just, you know, since we're starting, let's just keep it to the men because we don't really, you know, it's going to be very hard. We might be able to negotiate it, but, you know, we don't want to be surveying a woman with her husband and sitting there saying, that you know, the what <laughs> And so, I mean, I don't know, you know, for whatever reason, they've since they said, well, it's actually not that big a problem. We just send gender-specific interviewers, and we, I think they probably focus mainly on the herb, you know, Mahachkala and the, mm -hmm. the cities. Um, but so, so since then they've gotten more comfortable doing this and they say it can be done where you can interview people under standard conditions. Um, but at the time they were reluctant balking at that so we just said okay for that and plus your budget reasons. So, we, But you're right, I mean it does limit the generalizability certainly of yeah. those. And, and how in general you select the respondents? Is it actually like truly randomized or it's a probability like for, for sample. For this, for this so, one. so it's multi-stage cluster sampling. So, so the uh, the in, in Russia, uh, at the, so you first select uh, you know the oblasts. You stratify them based on some criteria. You randomly so select proportionally yeah. size. Well, no, you don't select people based on the religion. So, so that's why. So we. Um, so it's it's all based on geography. So, so you, you within. The oldest, then you select electoral districts, the just the to to be the secondary sampling units, and then within the electoral district, you use a random walk algorithm, where so you know to to do a fully random sample, you need a list of everybody. And yeah. We don't have those, or at least the Labada Center doesn't have it. Maybe Putin has. It. I don't know. But um, the uh, so 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 what we did that was different that we had to fight with a lot is. It's, it's that last stage with the random walk algorithm where the interviewers are tempted to cheat because if you're an interviewer, you have to go and you have to do a certain, you get paid for the interview, you have to go and you're supposed to go to this house and then go, you know, four more houses down into the third apartment there. And, then, and it's very tempting if you knock on the door and no one's home, you know, you have to go back, you're supposed to go back there three times, but if you hear someone on the neighboring apartment, you're tempted to go there. So what we did is we had the supervisors map out the route 
independently of interviewers and then just assign interviewer specific addresses which the supervisors can then go quality control and check to make sure they did this. And it costs a little bit more because they usually just do it. Oh, yeah, they tell you, yeah, do yeah. this, do this. And who knows who they actually, and who knows what, how that biases the sample. But anyway, so, and then within the household, there's a, we, they, we use the nearest birthday method. So you go, there's a, you know, how many people live, oh, I should have said these are 18 to 49 year olds too. So if there's more than one 18 to 49 year old in the household, then you choose the one with the nearest birthday. Uh, which, unless you're an astrologer, you believe in astrology, you should not buy a bias If you believe in astrology, you might bias But uh, I don't, so. But so, yeah, so we don't, we don't sample, and that's why, to get a Muslim sample, the only way we could do about, without using a quota type of approach, which has problems, methodological problems, was to oversample regionally. So that's why we chose those four regions to have these extra 100 responds mm -hmm. in each, because we figured we'd catch a lot of Muslims that way by randomness. Thanks. Yeah. Mayla, did you have a question? Um, I had a question if about um, if you had a chance to uh, control for urban versus uh, rural population, because um, they're actually quite, they can be quite different, both in terms of views, education, now, socioeconomic status and also um, just the general level of quality of life and so like in Tatarstan, you know, people in Kazan tend to uh, have a, mm -hmm. you know, both different views but also uh, different quality of life and this leads to, so if you may remember, there was an incident with a social worker in Chechnya, a woman who posted a video, right, mm -hmm. uh, criticizing Kadyrov and citing all the problems, poverty, and her salaries were held, was hold back, held back, uh, I think, a few months. So she was bringing up, um, you know, structural issues, economic issues, as a point of criticism. And she was from a rural area, from what I understand. And um, so obviously the support for Kaderif was not there, but, you know, they dealt with her, so, which could be why it was a lesson, right? That's that's another thing that Kadyrov does. He uh, pub teaches public lessons. He he publicly, um, publicly yes, and yes. Oh, you know, demonstrates people his and on a on a more or less. So so rural versus um, urban, and then maybe one way also to um, get at this issue is to ask, well, what kind of um, uh, Political structure? Do you support? Do you support democracy? Do you support? That would be an indirect way because it would be interesting if you find um, that, for example, people in the North Caucasus, or you know, say that so they, they support Kadyrov and, uh, and Putin, and yet they support democracy and are opposed to authoritarianism. You know, and uh, that would be an indirect way. Yeah, yeah. So uh, several good points, right? So we do, we do. We do have data on whether they live in a rural locality as opposed to the city. And so, so when we go the next step and do the multivariate analysis where we control for all those factors, that will certainly be one that we control for. And we could also test for interactions to see if you know the differences between Muslims and non-Muslims are greater in the rural areas as opposed to the urbanized areas. Um, in terms of the support for democracy, so we, as we were discussing earlier, yeah, we do have different measures. We don't see a lot of uh, we don't see a lot of um, variation between the Muslims and the non-Muslims in terms of such things as you know how important uh, are free and fair elections for the country to flourish um, you know how are, are, are protests a legitimate uh, form of political expression um, there's other me measures that escape my mind immediately but so we have these things and we don't. I mean, in terms of that producing support for Putin, well, so so it's weird, but you don't actually see it. Now, maybe, you know, we didn't ask about Kadyrov, and I regret it. I wish we could, you know, if we do the survey today, um, I, I should be able to do another survey next, you know, about next uh, January. So I will ask certainly about Kadyrov. There are some Russian public opinion polls that suggest that nationwide he's not all that popular, but he does. So no one's really popular, except for Putin. There's Putin. And then everybody else is in like single digits, you know. But, but Kadyrov maybe is like six percent, whereas everybody else is two percent. You know, that's sort of a, how I see it. Uh, 
Let's maybe because we passed time, oh, so sure, let's yeah, just stop officially yeah. here and we thank Ted for his presentation. Oh, thank you.